we've been in the middle of a, a series talking about the enemies that we have to deal with. And we started describing the three enemies every Christian faces, the world, the devil, and the flesh. And uh, we talked at length about the world for a couple of weeks. Last week we started talking about the flesh. And today we're going to wrap that up. Now the Apostle Paul wrote these words in the book of Romans when he said, I don't understand myself at all. If I really want to do what's right, but I just can't seem to do it, I end up doing what I don't want to do, the very thing I hate. I know perfectly well that what I'm doing is wrong, but I just can't seem to help myself. It is sin inside of me that is stronger than I am and makes me do these evil things. It seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Something else deep within me is at war with my mind and wins the fight. And it makes me a slave to sin. Now, if I was going to use a biblical definition of the flesh that we wrestle with, it would be the fact that we all have to wrestle with our sinful nature. We all have a nature inside of us. Now, we had our kids singing today, which is perfect, on the flesh weekend, because, number one, how many of you know even kids have to struggle with their flesh? By show of hands, that's right. And uh, have you ever seen a selfish child? Right? I mean, they selfish right out the womb, ain't they? They're not worried about you, whether or not you're getting any sleep, mama, or what you got going on. And if you put two kids in a room with a hundred toys, and one of them picks up one toy, what toy does the other one want? That one right there. That's the kid's flesh. Not only do kids struggle with their flesh, but kids bring out the struggle with the flesh in their parents. Amen? Have your kids ever gotten you in the flesh? By show of hands, be honest today. That's right. Look around. And what's worse is when it's not your kid, but somebody else's kid gets you in the flesh, and you think, where's his mama? Somebody needs to wrangle that kid up. Well, here's the deal with our sinful nature. The Lord wants us to overcome our sinful nature. In Romans 8, it says, those dominated by the sinful nature, think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, Think about things that please the Holy Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind ends up leading to death. But when you let the Holy Spirit of God control your life and control your mind, it leads you to life and to peace. So today, what we want to focus on is how do we overcome our struggles with our sinful nature? Well, there's four things I'm going to give you today. The first one, if you're taking notes, is overcoming our sinful desires and dysfunction requires resisting temptation. Resisting temptation. Great Bible verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13. If you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except that what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will never let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. This is what that Bible verse is telling us. In order to overcome temptation, we have to stand firmly. you got to brace yourself. you got to realize that your own flesh is going to attack you, and you got to prepare yourself for it. I'm very proud of myself this morning. I did not have a donut. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I prepared myself on the way in. I said, Manly, whatever you do, don't go buy those donuts. Because I knew if I went by, I was probably going to eat 12. Amen? I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? And I know myself, I'd be in the bathroom eating one in the stall so nobody see me, you know? I don't want to face your judgy eyes. The second thing it takes is not just standing firmly, but resisting fiercely. It says you got to stand up under it. you got to make sure that you're able to resist things. Now, we just had this weekend our Pure Desire University training, which was all about understanding how to overcome lust in this world. Powerful training. And in it, it was talking about willpower. But it showed a little video in the training, and it said, you know, usually when people refer to willpower, they're talking about one thing, but willpower is really three different things. It is willpower. It is the power to decide what you will do. It is won't power to decide what you won't do, but it's also want power to decide who you want to be. And in life, a lot of times when we talk about willpower, we just think about want power. But sometimes the best way to overcome something is not to think about what you won't do, 
How many times have you said to yourself, I won't do that, and you ended up doing it, right? Because it was on your mind. It's about instead, what will I do instead, or who do I want to become? And that's what it means to resist temptation fiercely. And then here's the third thing, you got to trust God faithfully. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it starts out by saying, God is faithful. Let's say that word faithful together on three. One, two, three, faithful. Now, I want you to understand this. In today's world, we've watered this word down. A lot of times if I said, hey, I'm going to be faithful to my wife, Dana, most people would think that means I'm going to be a one-woman man. But for me to be faithful to my wife means far more than that. It means I'm reliable, I'm trustworthy, I'm dependable, I'm consistent, I do what I say I'm going to do, when I say I'm going to do it, I follow through with my word, she can count on me, she knows what she's getting from me, and in my life I am faithful, mostly reliable to her. That's what it means to be faithful. Well, that's who God is to us. When it says God is faithful, it means God's on time. He shows up. You can depend on him. You can count on him. And when you face temptation, you need to start looking for the way out because God said he's faithful and he will always provide a way out of this temptation. You just need to ask yourself, what does it mean to overcome this temptation? Here's the second thing it takes. Overcoming sinful desires and dysfunctions also requires upgrading our relationships. Proverbs 12, 26 says this, The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. Here's the thing you got to understand. It is amazing what friends can convince us to do. Anybody here ever done something you didn't want to do because people kept pressuring you to do it? And you finally say, you know what, I'm tired of you asking, I'm just going to give in to that. Have you ever done something stupid because your friends pressured you to do it? You know, the reality is the friends you hang out with and the people you spend time with play such a role in what you're tempted and what you give in to doing and how you surrender to your flesh. You know, it's amazing. I remember when I first started going to church. Most of my friends were not thinking, man, that's awesome. I'm glad that's what you're doing with your life. And if I invited them, they would think, man, you crazy. Some of them even said, man, what's wrong with you? Have you been brainwashed or are you drinking the Kool-Aid? Anybody heard something like this before, right? Like, man, you go to church on Sunday and Wednesday, what's wrong with you, right? Listen to me. Those same friends, if I told them, hey, man, I'm going to get loaded tonight. You want to come with me? What would they have said? Sign me up. I'm ready right now. Are you on your way? Where are we meeting at? See, what's incredible in my life is to see how when I want to make godly changes or overcome my flesh or overcome temptations, I've got to surround myself with people who are trying to build their relationship with God. Now, if you look at your friends and the people you spend time with and you were being honest with yourself, a lot of you would say, you know what, my friends really ain't chasing after a strong relationship with God. That's not their priority. Now, I'm not saying they're bad people or you got to cut them out of your life altogether, but I'm saying you better surround yourself with people who are trying to go to the direction you're trying to go in. I got a little statement I like to live my life off of. It's called, crackheads live in crack houses. Now, that might surprise some of you, but I can tell you this. If you go to a crack house, you won't find people studying for the bar exam. Right? You won't find people setting a budget to live by or praying. Well, they might be praying for more crack, but that's different. Some people have said it like this, if you hang out in a barber shop long enough, you're bound to get your hair cut. The idea is if you keep on spending your time with people and in places that are violating your relationship with God and helping you give in to your flesh, it's only a matter of time before you end up giving in to that temptation. In order to overcome this, you got to change or upgrade some of your relationships and get around people who are walking with the Lord. Here's the third thing it takes. Revitalizing your heart is what's required to overcome temptation. You should probably memorize this Bible verse right here. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above everything else. This is more important than anything else in your life is to watch your heart. Why? Because Jesus said this in Mark 7. It's not what goes into your body 
that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes out of your heart. From within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. And these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. Here's what the Bible's saying. It's not just your circumstances or your friends or the people around you that cause you problems. The problems actually come from within you. If you was on a deserted island, you would still find a way to sin. You'd still find a way to lust. You'd still find a way to gossip. You'd still find a way to talk bad about something or complain or to have a negative attitude. You still find a way to have anxiety or fear or live in your flesh. The reality is these problems come from within. And in order to overcome them, there's some things you got to do. You got to learn to crucify your flesh. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature, their flesh, to his cross and crucified them there. Let me explain to you like this. What this means is you have to learn to become an expert at repenting. Now, how often do you need to repent? All the time. You might think the longer I'm a Christian and the more mature I am with God, the less I'll sin and the less I will need to repent. That's actually not the way it works. See, what happens is the closer you get to God, the more mature you become, the more you start realizing just how jacked up you really are, just how sinful you really are, just how many issues you really have. See, new Christians, they think, man, I got to change like these three things and I'm straight. Mature Christians are like, good Lord, I'm a disaster. Everything in my life is wrong. And you learn to be a mature Christian means you're repenting all the time. I was repenting this morning over and over and over again. You know, when we move where we have in church, it's very stressful to me. You might not like it. I really don't like it. We don't know where stuff goes. We're trying to figure stuff out. I was texting my wife this morning. I'm like, I'm so stressed out. I had my 12-year-old son praying for me because I'm overwhelmed. And I'm thinking, Lord, I'm so full of my flesh. What am I even doing preaching this sermon today? Let me repent. Let me repent. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You ever been at work and somebody's acting up in your life and you think, Lord, you better show up right now because I'm fixing to kill somebody and you got to repent. And then five minutes later, the same person does something else and you got to repent again. I just dealt with you. Am I the only one here? I work at a church too. <laughs> you got to repent regularly. That's what it means to crucify your flesh. Then you've got to give yourself completely to God. And Romans 6, 12 and 13 says, don't let sin control the way you live. Don't give in to sinful desires. Instead, give yourself completely to God. This is a big problem. We want to give ourselves mostly to God. Or partially to God but God says no buddy that's not the way it works I'm gonna need all of you I need you completely and you need to constantly say to the Lord Lord I need to give it all back to you I took a little bit back I tried to do more on my own strength and ability I got back in my flesh here it is God to give it all to you again and that's how you measure yourself have you given yourself completely to God or just mostly or partially or somewhat, you got to surrender everything once again. And then here's the third thing about revitalizing your heart. It takes renewing your mind. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, how do you renew your mind? What does that mean? I'm going to give you some examples. Here's an idea. Maybe fasting. Maybe fasting. Fasting is abstaining from food for a prolonged period of time. I've fasted for 21 days on five different occasions. I've fasted for seven days, three days, numerous times. One time I told a person I was doing a three-day fast, and they said, you can't do that, you're going to die. I said, no, you're just fat. You feel like you're going to die, but you're not. Right? You take that food away, and all of a sudden, all of your flesh starts rising up, and you realize what's really there. Because I'm going to tell you, there ain't nothing that brings out the flesh like being hungry. Amen? 
How many you know what I'm talking about? You get angry when you get hungry. How many you with somebody to get hangry? Look, we got a class on Wednesday nights. We teaching on angry right now. You might need to come to that at 6.30. It's a bunch of other angry people. Everybody's cussing one another out in the parking lot before they come in. I'm just kidding. I think. I got there early, so I wouldn't have that problem, you know. Sometimes it's not just fasting. Sometimes you need to cleanse your mind. How do you cleanse your mind? Cut out the things that you fill in your mind with that's really not good for you. Now, you might think there's certain things that I'm doing that's really not bad for me. Listen, there's some music that's not good for you. There's some television programs that are not good for you. Simple things like the news. Don't watch the news before you go to bed because there's no good news. It's bad news, right? Let me tell you about the six people that got murdered today. Let me tell you, if you eat this, it's going to kill you. Let me tell you about the weather. It's fixing to be hot and there's a hurricane coming. You're probably going to die. It's not a good idea. There's certain things you watch that you got to cut out of your life. There's some cleansing. Get off of the internet. Get off of Facebook. Fast face. Cleanse yourself from Facebook for 21 days and watch how your life changes. One person's clapping over there. They got some Facebook addicts, you understand? Got to cleanse. Get your mind right. Get that out of your mind. Then here's another thing. You got to fill your mind with positive things. Maybe you need to listen to some worship music on the way to work and while you're sitting in traffic. It's hard to cuss people out when you're singing grace like a wave crashing over me. It's hard to go, I'm fixing to crash, it's calling to you. Maybe you need to listen to some sermons. I remember when I was a new Christian, I probably listened to four sermons a day. I was like a sermon junkie because I was trying to fill my mind, memorizing scripture. Some of you, you need to memorize some scriptures and fill your mind with what the Bible has to say. Like if you're a worrier, you should memorize Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Give thanksgiving and supplication to God. Present your request to him, and then the peace of God that transforms all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why do I know that verse? Yeah, because I'm a worrier. Worried about what this person thinks about me and worried about what's happening at work and worried about whether or not church is going to happen and worried about this and worried about that. I got to quote that verse to myself all the time. I got to fill my mind with the truths of God's word so I won't believe the lies my flesh wants me to believe. Philippians 4.8 says, Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Renew your mind. Revitalize your heart. Transform the way that you think and what you understand yourself to be. And then here's the fourth and final thing. Overcoming sinful desires and dysfunctions requires surrendering to God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. It says in Galatians 5, Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. And then it goes on to say in verses 22 to 23, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, here's the thing. It says the Holy Spirit produces this, not we produce it. So what happens in your life is anytime you encounter one of these things, like let's, let's, let's break it down. How many of you have ever been impatient? By show of hands. That's you, right? Like you behind a lady at the grocery store with coupons. Right? And so you try to get in a different register, but you go over there and now they need a price check. You know mine. I don't like anybody in the self-checkout that don't know how to self-check out. Like, if you can't figure out the scanner, this ain't your line. There's a different line for you. We was just at Academy the other day. My wife wanted to buy a shirt that didn't have no tag. I'm like, oh, Lord, gee, you know, this 45 minutes right here. Y'all got a cot I can break out in the front and wait for you to figure out how much this costs? Like, my thing is, if you don't know how much it is, can't I just go home with that for free? <laughs> Patience, whoo, that'll work you. Anybody here, you ever worry about anything? Yeah, that's peace. That's a peace problem. The opposite of worry is peace. Oh, 
Kindness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You ever want to be mean to somebody on purpose? Like, oh, I can't wait to tell them what's up. Please ask me my opinion. See, meanness is the opposite of kindness, and that's when you know you're not living your life driven by the Holy Spirit. What about self-control? Anybody ever lost self-control? I know that's me right there. My wife's thinking, yep, manly, you need to preach this sermon to yourself right here. She's going to buy me the tape of this message. I already know. <laughs> self-control. Gentleness. You ever been rough with somebody? See, gentleness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Faithfulness. You ever been unreliable? You ever didn't keep your word? Didn't do what you said you were going to do? Joy. Let me, you ever complain? And show of hands. Complaining is the opposite of joy. Because people that are full of joy, they ain't got no room for complaining in their life. The reality is all of these things are markers in your life that the flesh is in control. And when you see one of them, you got to realize you don't have a fruit problem. You got a root problem. The root problem is your flesh is in control, not the Holy Spirit. Your flesh is guiding your life. Your sinful nature is driving the car. That's running the ship. That's dictating where everything is going. It's your flesh that's the problem. And you need to crucify that flesh and surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit, the control of the Holy Spirit, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the guide of the Holy Spirit. Because when you get the Spirit in the right place, it's amazing. All the fruit starts changing on its own. See, if you got a patience problem, you don't need to be more patient. Matter of fact, the worst thing you could do is pray for patience because God is going to put you in situations to reveal to you how you ain't patient. If you don't have peace, the worst thing you could do is say, Lord, give me, please give me peace. Oh, well, he's going to put you in a situation to reveal to you that the reason why you ain't got no peace is because your flesh is leading your life. The answer is not denying the flesh, arguing with the flesh, manipulating the flesh, trying to subdue the flesh. You can't subdue yourself. The answer is to surrender control of your life to the Holy Spirit. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to pray for me. Pray with me. And the answer to this prayer, when, you th when you're thinking about this, the reason this prayer is the answer is because this is a prayer you should pray at every meal. Every single time you eat, when you go to pray, this is what you should pray. I don't have to ask the question, how many of you struggle with your flesh? Because I already know the answer, 100% of you. It's not about whether or not you have a flesh or you struggle with your flesh. It's how you surrender control of your life to the Holy Spirit. So I want you to pray out loud with me. Dear Lord Jesus, say it so God can hear you. Dear Lord Jesus, crucify my flesh. And let me surrender to the power of your Holy Spirit. Right now, I give your Holy Spirit control of my life. You take the wheel. You drive. I'll follow you. You lead me to love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and the goodness, and the gentleness, and the faithfulness, and to self-control. Help me realize my biggest problem is me. Help me surrender to you today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray.